For the past 130 years, the American medical industry has been involved in the business of removing part or all of the sexual organs of male and female children for profit. The origins of human genital mutilation among prehistoric primitive peoples is a matter for theory and speculation. The origins of human genital mutilation in the United States is another matter. Complete documentation exists to reveal when, why, how, and why genital mutilation was introduced in the United States. Seen in the proper context of the entire scope of Western history, the modern American enigma of sexual mutilation is shown to be an historic aberration of profound significance and degree, and one that could never have been predicted, and one that perhaps never could have been avoided. In the early 19th century, French medical experts had dis recently discovered the disease spermatorrhea. Spermatorrhea was a serious disease whose sole symptom was the ejaculation of sperm under any other condition except connubial bliss. In other words, the release of sperm due to wet dreams or masturbation was now classified as a venereal disease as severe and as dangerous as any other and probably more dangerous if only because more people suffered from it more often. Hundreds of case reports published in medical journals all over the world proved the harm of spermatorrhea. There was no doubt in any medical expert's mind that spermatorrhea was a grave threat to the health of Western peoples. The important element of the theory of spermatorrhea is that it occurred only in, with the loss of sperm. The theory of spermatorrhea was founded upon the old medical model of fluid balances. Sperm being a bodily fluid required a balance with all other bodily fluids. Um, these theories had their own treatments. Spermatorrhea was treated by preventing loss of sperm. French physicians such as Professor Lallemand of Montpellier and Léopold Deslandes were the acknowledged world authorities on the treatment of spermatorrhea. They stuck long steel rods or bougies down the shaft of the penis, injected silver nitrate, cauterized the urethra, prostate, and semi seminal vesicles. In 1836, um, being sensitive to the new theory of disease, Lallemand also advised circumcision as a cure for spermatorrhea, but only in the most difficult cases. And he got the idea for circumcision from the writings of the Franco-American physician Philippe Ricoeur, who had first observed the surgery among the immigrant Jews in France. By the middle of the 19th century, American physicians developed the concept and the theory of the reflex neurosis theory of disease. In this context, the sexual organs and all the erotic sensations they produced were held to be the cause of all human disease. In order to justify this theory, the penis had to be redefined in order to transform normal anatomy into pathology. In the reflex theory of disease, erotic sensation was defined as irritation. Orgasm was redefined as convulsion. Erection of the penis was now redefined as priapism, both a symptom and a cause of disease. Doctors now believe that the stimulation of the genitals could cause disease in other parts of the body. Since the foreskin is one of the most highly innervated parts of the penis, and since masturbation in intact boys involves manual stimulation and manipulation of the foreskin, masturbation was seen as a cause of reflex disease through the medium of the foreskin. Doctors now re-examined the three distinguishing qualities of the immature fo juvenile foreskin, all of which are normal stages of penile development. Generous length, adherence to the glands, and inelasticity of the prepucial orifice. They pathologized these normal qualities and grouped them under the general diagnosis of phimosis. American physicians invented the term congenital phimosis to indicate that the adhesion of the foreskin to the glands in infants was in fact a congenital birth defect. They adopted the term acquired phimosis to indicate a fictitious condition in which a previously unadhered foreskin became adhered to the glands as a result of masturbation. The term hypertrophic phimosis, or redundancy, indicated a type of phimosis whose sole symptom was a foreskin that a doctor arbitrarily determined was too long. In the absence of the germ theory of disease, or any knowledge about nutrition, American physicians blamed all childhood diseases, all bacterial and viral infections, all pathological symptoms of malnutrition and overwork on phimosis. Girls did not escape these theories either. Doctors, redef doctors defined phimosis in females as an inherit inheritance of the clitoral hood to the clitoris. 
In 1845, in his book, A Treatise on the Diseases of the Sexual Organs, the American physician Edward H. Dixon, who was one of Lalamon's greatest champions in America, also mentioned circumcision in connection with phimosis, which he defines as an elongation of the prepuce. Dixon's advocacy of circumcision, like Lalamon's before him, was ignored by the American medical establishment. America was not yet ready for circumcision. Circumcision was forgotten for the next two decades while other surgical treatments for masturbation and phimosis were developed. Since amputation was considered thoroughly modern and advanced, Americans did try other varieties of amputation as treatment for masturbation. On June 22, 1842, the Boston Medical and Surgical Journal reported that a Dr. Winslow Lewis of Boston had severed and tied the left spermatic artery of a young man after being treated for excessive masturbation. In 1843, however, the very first report of castration for masturbation was published by Dr. Josiah Crosby. After failing to cure masturbation through various cathartics and emetics in a 22-year-old boy whose health had been ruined by masturbation, Crosby castrated the boy and pronounced him cured. The American medical establishment responded with interest. Two years later, in 1845, Dr. Samuel McMinn published a revolutionary case report in the Boston Medical and Surgical Journal. An insane woman living in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, had taken a razor and amputated the whole of her external and internal sexual organs. Dr. McMinn was called into the scene and fully expected her to die from her massive wounds. However, the wounds healed, and as they did, her reason returned. Fascinated by this development, McMinn speculated, and I quote, And the results of this case may suggest a remedy. Whether it was the great loss of blood, the removal of the external organs, and the counter-irritation consequent that cured the patient is a question for the consideration of the profession. The title he gave to his report, however, betrayed his and presumably the editor of the journal's opinion on the source of the cure. The report was dramatically entitled, Insanity Cured by Excision of the External Organs of Generation. Ten years later, in 1855, a Dr. William T. Taylor published a similar report involving a man. A cigar maker from Philadelphia had gone insane and hacked off his penis and testicles with a broken bottle. Although he bred profusely, his wounds healed, and miraculously his reason was completely restored. No further proof was needed. A revolutionary new medical response to masturbatory insanity had been established just as the innovation of aseptic surgery was developing. 19th century American medicine now embarked upon the wholesale amputation of the sexual organs as a cure for seemingly unrelated diseases. Insane asylums castrated inmates on a massive scale to prevent their masturbating and to cure their insanity. Until the beginning of the 20th century, boys who had been caught masturbating were frequently committed to insane asylums, circumcised, castrated, and shackled in their cells. Females were also castrated through the removal of the ovaries as a cure for hysteria, epilepsy, and nymphomania. On December 1st, 1855, um, there took place a very important event in the history of circumcision. This is the date that the English physician Jonathan Hutchinson published his famous paper on the influence of circumcision in preventing syphilis. London was then experiencing a massive immigration of Jews from the ghettos of Eastern Europe. Hutchinson reported that in the Metropolitan Free Clinic in London, where he practiced, fewer Jews than Englishmen sought treatment for syphilis. Being ignorant of the germ theory of disease and the quarantine effect of the ghetto, Hutchinson speciously argued that the only circumcision could account for the difference in the disease rates. Hutchinson's paper was widely reprinted in foreign medical journals. Two years later, it was used as evidence in a religious tribunal. In 1857, a Dr. Levitt, a Viennese Jew, under the influence of his Western education and perhaps the anti-circumcision movement within Reform Judaism, refused to allow his newborn son to be circumcised. The local rabbinate, under the direction of a certain Dr. Joseph Hirschfeld, held up Hutchinson's paper as evidence and justification for the rabbinate to seize custody of Levitt's son and forcibly circumcise the child, leaving Levitt without legal recourse. Twenty years after its first initial I'm sorry, its first unsuccessful introduction in America, circumcision now made a cautious reappearance in America. On August 12, 1861, 
Doc, a certain Dr. White read a paper before the Boston Society for Medical Improvement in which he mentioned that circumcision could prevent masturbation. Seven years later, in 1868, a Dr. Charles Bliss wrote of his successes in curing masturbation by partial amputation of the prepuce. In 1869, a learned article by Dr. A.B. Arnold appeared describing the history of circumcision in the religious and tribal context of Jews, Muslims, and African animists. This new surgery, with so many useful properties, was now legitimized by placing it in the context of a long history, albeit a non-Western history. Various other surgeries for masturbation were developed in order to destroy sexual appetite, even after the introduction of circumcision. Spermectomy was especially popular. This operation was developed as a kinder alternative to castration and, considered a, and consisted of the surgical removal of the spermatic ducts, rather than the testicles. Neurectomy also had a certain vogue in the late 18th, 19th century. In this operation, the nerves to the penis were severed in order to destroy sexual sensation and function. American physicians also resorted to the relatively less dr drastic measures, such as slitting open the urethra, cauterizing the prostate, corporal punishment, blistering the penis raw with caustic acids, flaying the penile skin with razor blades, sewing the prepuce shut, with metal wire, or encasing the genitals in plaster or lockable medical, medical, sorry, metal, metal cages, or carefully fitting the penis with metal penile rings studded with sharp metallic teeth to discourage erections. For females, the preferred method of treatment for epilepsy and masturbation was clitoridectomy. One of the first reports of therapeutic clitoridectomy was published in the San Francisco Medical Press in 1862. The report read, and I quote, Dr. E.S. Cooper, editor of the San Francisco Medical Press, relates two cases of removal of the, removal by scalpel of the clitoris of young girls who were inveterately addicted to the habit of masturbation and for whom there was apparently no other alternative but hopeless insanity or an early grave. The result was a perfect cure in one case, and in the other the practice was broken up and all the mental faculties improved except the memory, which is not yet restored. In the late 1860s, British physician Isaac Baker Brown developed and promoted clitoridectomy as a cure for epilepsy. His self-advertised claims of miracle cures led to the universal adoption of clitoridectomy in the English-speaking world. In 1867, Dr. Baker Brown's methods were called into question by the London Obstetrical Society, which then ordered him to cease performing the surgery. Few doubted the proven efficacy of clitoridectomy. That was not the problem. Baker Brown was charged with failing to provide informed consent to his female patients. It was his method to routinely chloroform all females who came into his clinic, and no matter what their ailment was, to clitoridectomize them. The British medical press was unanimous, unanimous, un, unanimously in favor of banning Baker Brown from performing surgery, but he was vigorously defended in the American medical press. The editor of the Philadelphia-based journal, The Medical Record, strongly criticized the anti-clitoridectomy crusade in England, demanding to know, and I quote, what will now be the chance of recovery for the poor epileptic female with a clitoris? Clitoridectomy and female circumcision remained entrenched in American medical practice until the 1950s. There were many calls in the American medical press, often from female physicians, for the adoption of universal female circumcision. Clitoridectomy is still practiced in America today on intersexuals or other girls with a clitoris that either the parent or a doctor considers to be too large. At the 1870 meeting of the American Medical Association, the renowned American physician Louis A. Sayre, hailed as the father of orthopedics and who at the time was serving as the association's vice president and who later rose to become the president of the American Medical Association in 1880, read a paper entitled Partial Paralysis Paralysis from reflex irritation caused by congenital phimosis and inherent prepuce. Supporting his claims with numerous case studies and using the most scientific metho methodology available at the time, Sayre proved to his audience that a long inherent forest skin was not only the cause of paralysis and also hip joint disease, hernia, bad digestion, inflammation of the bladder, and clumsiness. Sayer reported in each case that amputation of the foreskin cured the disease. Cases of childhood diseases 
I'm sorry. Throughout his career, Sayer urged all physicians to first examine the penis in every case of childhood disease. And if phimosis were found, as it inevitably was in all children, to amputate without delay. All major American medical schools adopted Sayer's theory of reflex disease and phimosis into their curriculum. In 1870, Sayer reported to the New York Pathological Society that phimosis was the cause of epilepsy. English physicians had been using circumcision to cure epilepsy since 1865, but they connected the foreskin to masturbation and cited the prevention of masturbation as, the, as playing a role in the cure of epilepsy. Sayer maintained and proved that a long foreskin all by itself had the power to induce violent epileptic convulsions. Circumcision, of course, cured every case of epilepsy. As with paralysis, hundreds of case reports were published over the next 75 years, proving Sayre correct. At the 1875 meeting of the American Medical Association, Sayre delivered another lecture on phimosis that stunned his colleagues further and further propelled American medicine down the road of quackery. He informed them that he had discovered that a long, adherent foreskin could cut off circulation to the spinal column and thereby cause lameness, curvature of the spine, paralysis of the bladder, and club feet. <laughs> <laughs> Miraculously, circumcision brought immediate cure to all patients, including the patient with club feet. In the same lecture, he also presented several cases in which clitoridectomy brought instantaneous cure to paralytic girls. Among the more influential advocates of circumcision in the 1870s were Abraham Jacoby and M.J. Moses. Jacoby was the president and founder of the American Pediatric Society, the first chairman of the Session on Diseases of Children of the American Medical Association, president of the New York State Medical Society, president of the New York Academy of Medicine, and president of the Association of American Physicians. Both Jacoby and Moses claimed that Jews were immune to masturbation solely because they were circumcised. They were cited as authorities by medical writers for the next few decades. Both claimed that non-Jews were especially prone to masturbation and to the horrible diseases that resulted from masturbation solely because they had foreskins. Jacoby produced many studies to prove this and to prove that the male foreskin caused epilepsy, paralysis, paralysis malnutrition, hysteria, and other nervous disorders. In 1871, Moses wrote an exceedingly influential article that would change the course of American medicine. He stated, and I quote, I desire to ventilate the subject and as a physician have chosen the medium of the medical journal that I may not be trammeled in my expressions as I, un as I necessarily would were I confined to the pages of an ordinary paper. I refer to masturbation as one of those effects of a long prepuce, not that this vice is entirely absent in those who have undergone circumcision, though I never saw an instance in a Jewish child of very tender years except as the result of association with children whose covered glands have naturally impelled them to the habit. It is quite clear from context that the word, word hygienic has a different meaning than it does today. At this time, circumcisers used words such as hygiene to denote moral hygiene, not personal hygiene. Circumcisers likewise used the term sanitary to denote moral sanitary and moral purity, not the absence of germs or dirt. Remember, germs had not yet been discovered. Moses was widely quoted by circumcisionists. Moses was indeed one of the very first and certainly one of the most influential writers in an American medical journal to suggest circumcision as preventive and cure for masturbation. American physicians now argued that castration should be abandoned in favor of circumcision, since circumcision cured all the same diseases as castration, but did not affect procreation, as the example of the Jews demonstrated. An article that appeared in the medical record of 1895 explained the anti-masturbation theory of circumcision thus. In all cases of masturbation, circumcision is undoubtedly the physician's closest friend and ally. To obtain the best results, one must cut away enough skin and mucous membrane to rather put it on the stretch when erections come later. There must be no play in the skin after the wound has thoroughly healed, but it must fit tightly over the penis, for should there be any play, the patient will be found to readily resume his practice, not begrudging the time and extra energy required to produce the orgasm. It is true, however, that the longer it takes to have an orgasm, the less frequently it will be attempted. Consequently, the greater the benefit gained. In 1895, a textbook declared, Only with recent years has the physiology of nervous reflexes become better understood, 
and has circumcision become generally accepted among thinking surgeons. Not alone for local conditions is the operation demanded. In all cases in which male children are suffering from nerve tension, confirmed derangement of the digestive organs, restlessness, irritability, and other disturbances of the nervous system, even dechoria, convulsions, and paralysis, or where through nerve waste the nutritive facilities of the general system are below par and structural diseases are occurring, it should be considered, that is, circumcision should be considered as among the lines of treatment to be pursued. In an article entitled A Plea for Early Circumcision from 1901, from the um, journal Pediatrics, the author states, frequent micturition, loss of flesh, convulsions, phosphatic calculus, hernia, nervous exhaustion, dyspepsia, diarrhea, prolapse of rectum, balanitis, acute phimosis, and masturbation are all conditions induced by the constricted long prepuce and all to be rapidly remedied by the simple operation of circumcision. Thousands of such reports were published in reputable American medical journals. In 1890, Dr. William D. Gentry published a typical report entitled Nervous Derangements Produced by Sexual Irregularities in Boys, which detailed the frightening and varied consequences of phimosis, as well as the miracle cure to be found in circumcision. I quote, Whilst I was physician to the Children's Home in Kansas City in 1884 to 1885, there was brought to the home from some similar institution in Chicago a child two years and a half old who was blind deaf and dumb. It was nervous, fretful, and caused the matron a great deal of trouble. It was dwarfed and presented the peculiar general appearance which nearly every boy will present who is afflicted with sexual derangement. As soon as I saw the child, the thought came into my mind that the trouble had some connection with such derangement, and on making an examination of his penis, found that he had phimosis. With the consent of the father of the boy, I operated and removed the derangement. In two months, the child could see and make sounds as if to speak. In six months, he could hear, see, and speak. How could that be wrong? The early promoters of circumcision fully acknowledged the sexual functions of the prepuce and advocated circumcision as an intentional destruction of those functions. In 1900, the medical news reported... Finally, circumcision probably tends to increase the power of sexual control. The only physiological advantage which the prepuce can be supposed to confer is that of maintaining the penis in a condition susceptible to more acute sensation than would otherwise exist. It may increase the pleasure of coition and the impulse to it, but these are advantages which in the present state of society can well be spared. If in their loss, increase in sexual control should result, one should be thankful. After the germ theory of disease had become widely accepted and, the, and vitamins had been identified, most microbial diseases such as polio, tuberculosis, venereal disease, and such were silently removed from the list of diseases caused by phimosis. Still, the majority of American physicians believed that phimosis was the cause of those diseases not yet properly understood, such as epilepsy. Year by year, the list of diseases caused by phimosis continued to grow. Physicians, physicians even attributed death to phimosis. In 1912, Dr. Dana A. Sargent, a graduate of the College of Physicians and Surgeons at the University of Iowa and a colleague of Louis A. Sayre, published an analysis of phimosis entitled Nervous and Congenital Phimosis in the Philadelphia-based medical journal, The Medical Council. He wrote, In many children, partial paralysis, lack of power of coordination, and apparent idiocy are dependent in a great measure upon some irritation of the genital organs. In males, this is sometimes due to the constriction around the gland's penis, producing continual priapism, the result of which is wasting and exhaustion of the nervous system, sufficient to produce more or less paralysis, and in some cases, complete loss of speech and vision. Some cases resembling hip joint disease, while others only have enuriasis, night terrors, sleeping on the knees and elbows, moaning or crying, or restlessness. These are common symptoms. This condition is a great cause of early pollution, that is, masturbation. And if for no other reason, this operation, circumcision, should be performed to relieve the patient from future destruction. What will it mean for a child to start out right without being stunted or dwarfed by this condition? In 1914, the Journal of the American Medical Association published a report by one of the 20th century's most vehement circumcisionists, Abraham L. Wolbarst. 
a urologist practicing at Beth Israel Hospital in New York, um, Wolbars was prominent, a prominent and influential member of the American Medical Association, as well as the notorious American Society for Sanitary and Moral Prophylaxis, which was a reform organization committed to the ab- abolition of extramarital sexual relations. Wolbarst invented most of the current arguments used to justify the forced circumcision of American boys. He was also one of the first to demand that all children be circumcised. He stated, It is generally accepted that irritation derived from a tight prepuce may be followed by nervous phenomena, among these being convulsions and outbreaks resembling epilepsy. It is therefore not at all improbable that in many infants who die in convulsions, the real cause of death is a long or tight prepuce. He added, It is the moral duty of every physician to encourage circumcision in the young. Circumcision continued to gain acceptance among physicians. Medical textbooks instructed obstetricians and pediatricians to examine the penis of every newborn boy to determine if the foreskin was retractable. If not, it was to be immediately amputated. Decades later, when most most physicians had converted to the theory that epilepsy was more a problem of the brain than the foreskin, the notion of phimosis should have died out. But instead, circumcisionists like Wolbars continued to be proven wrong. <coughs> I'm sorry, they refused to be um, proven wrong. As late as the middle 1930s, Wolbars continued to insist that epilepsy and other sorts of convulsions were caused by the foreskin. Additionally, he searched for new diseases to blame on phimosis. In 1932, Wolbars published the definitive paper on circumcision as prevention of penile cancer. Based on his belief that Jews were immune to penile cancer, Wolbars theorized that penile cancer was caused by the accumulation of pathogenic products in the prepucial cavity. No scientific validation was offered to support this idea, yet based on this paper, the theory that smegma was a carcinogen became widely accepted as fact in the United States. The profit margin for circumcision rose in about 1934, when Aaron Goldstein and Dr. Hiram Yellen propelled themselves out of the Depression and into the realm of multimillionaires by inventing and mass-marketing the now ubiquitous Gomco clamp. This heavy steel device is still used today to crush and sever the living foreskins of male babies. By the middle 20th century, American physicians had forgotten that the vast majority of boys had long, adherent, and inelastic foreskins at birth. It never occurred to them that the characteristics of the juvenile foreskin were not birth defects, but rather normal stages of development. In the midst of the phimosis hysteria, one lone anatomist in 1933, Glenn A. Debert of the Daniel Baugh Institute of Anatomy at Jefferson Medical College, made a careful investigation of the foreskin. His published study, based on autopsy investigation, It was a scientific account of the development of the foreskin in utero and the process of the separation of the foreskin from the glands after birth. Debert determined that the the adherence of the foreskin to the glands was not phimosis or a birth defect, but a normal stage of penile development. Debert's study was largely ignored. In 1935, the British anatomist Richard H. Hunter of the Department of Anatomy at Queen's University in Belfast, published a detailed description of the embryological development of the foreskin, but this too was largely ignored. Expanding upon Wolbers' theory of smegma as a carcinogen and repeating the myth of Jewish immunity to disease, Dr. Abraham Ravitch, a urologist at Israel's Zion Hospital in Brooklyn, in 1942 postulated a causal link between the foreskin and prostate cancer. He also popularized the hitherto obscure theory, first proposed in 1928, that cervical cancer of the female was caused by male smegma. Ravitch was one of the most active circumcision proponents in the middle of the 20th century. He even made attempts to export circumcision to the Soviet Union and Japan. During World War II, certain military medical doctors instituted a campaign of mass circumcision of American soldiers in all branches of the American armed forces. Even at the height of the war, Lieutenant Marvin L. Gerber, a Navy physician, confidently stated in the pages of the United States Naval Medical Bulletin that circumcision was one of the most commonly performed medical operations in the Navy, even more commonly performed than trauma surgery, more common than bullet repair, in the middle of a war. Military medical records cite an epidemic of phimosis, and paraphimosis to justify the circumcision campaign. 
Soldiers were subjected to unannounced inspections of their penises, which were called short arm inspections. Soldiers with intact penises were declared thymotic and sent off to be circumcised under threat of court-martial. Forced circumcision of soldiers may also have served the psychological purpose of of establishing the military's complete dominance of the lives and bodies of the common soldier. The military showed thereby that it could order a soldier to give up part of his penis just as easily as it could order him to give up his whole body. Military documents reveal that Negroes were especially targeted for this abuse. The military blamed Negroes for the spread of venereal disease. Military physicians such as Eugene A. Hand, who practiced during the war at the Naval Hospital in St. Albans, New York, were responsible for the military adopting this view of Negroes as dangerous disease carriers. On June 12, 1947, Hand delivered a paper entitled Circumcision and Venereal Disease before the members of the American Medical Association at their annual meeting held that year in Atlantic City. Comparing the rates of venereal diseases between Jews, Gentiles, and Negroes, and adding to it a generous dose of racism, Hand theorized that circumcision could prevent venereal disease. He wrote, and I quote, Circumcision is not common among Negroes. Many Negroes are promiscuous. In Negroes, Negroes, there is little circumcision, little knowledge or fear of venereal disease, and promiscuity in almost a hornet's nest of infection. Thus, the venereal rate in Negroes has remained high. Between these two extremes, there is the Gentile, with the venereal disease rate higher than that of the Jews, but much lower than that of Negroes. In the same study, Hand also found that cancer of the tongue was more common among those with foreskins than those without. The popular magazine Newsweek reported Hand's finding and set an historical precedent for a popular journal reporting and promoting circumcision directly to the masses. From this time forward, the promoters of mass circumcision would issue press releases coinciding with the publication of their medical journal articles extolling the newly discovered disease-preventing properties of circumcision as they were invented. Then, in 1949, the British Medical Journal published the landmark study The Fate of the Foreskin by the bright young physician Douglas Gardner. Drawing on the embryological and histological research of Debert and Hunter and presenting his own meticulous research on perpetual adhesion and retractability in children, Gardner successfully debunked the Famosus myth. Gardner not only demonstrated that non-retractability adherence and length were normal conditions of the juvenile foreskin, but he also brilliantly debunked all of the then current alleged benefits of circumcision. Gardner's paper generated enormous interest among physicians and attracted the interest of the British government. On the basis of the findings of Gardner's paper, the British government's um, National Health Service ceased all payment for neonatal circumcision. The United Kingdom, the only country in Europe whose medical profession had ever been influenced by the American masturbation and phimosis hysterias to the point of actually experimenting with neonatal circumcision, was quick to become a relatively circumcision-free nation. In the United States, however, Gardner's paper was largely ignored and the phimosis hysteria continued unabated. The foreskin was now blamed for venereal disease and cervical cancer in wives of intact men. Medical textbooks continued to advise obstetricians to examine every newborn boy for a foreskin that was either too long or adherent, and to perform an immediate foreskin amputation if these symptoms of phimosis were detected, as they almost always were. In 1953, two obstetricians, Richard L. Miller and Donald C. Snyder, published a very influential paper in the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, calling for the immediate circumcision of all newborn males, Ignoring Gardner's, um, excuse me, ignoring Gardner and relying heavily upon the writings of Wolbarst, Miller and Snyder argued that phimosis required immediate surgical correction and that, and I quote, circumcision will reduce the incidence of masturbation, increase the male libido, and increase longevity and immunity to nearly all physical and mental diseases. That was 1953. Besides, they argued, immediate circumcision followed birth, following birth was convenient for the doctor and economically in the best interest of the hospital. The leading obstetrical textbooks were rewritten now to include Miller and Snyder's arguments. Increasing numbers of corporations, corp- corporate-run American hospitals and private insurance companies entered into the profitable routine neonatal circumcision business. 
justifying their universal focus on the sexual organs of baby boys with the anti-sexual and pseudo-scientific arguments of the 19th century. Private, corporation-controlled, for-profit hospitals instituted policies of immediate and automatic circumcision in the delivery room of all male neonates. Parents were not allowed a say in this matter, but in most cases, they did not object. Meanwhile, there were repeated calls for routine female circumcision at birth. And in the 1950s, American physicians stepped up their efforts to make adult female circumcision more widely practiced in the United States. In 1959, Dr. W.G. Rathman of Inglewood, California, published an important medical article promoting wide-scale female circumcision as a cure for psychosomatic illnesses and marital problems. He also took the occasion to tout his newly patented female circumcision clamp. As more and more private hospitals throughout the country instituted a policy of a corporate policy of automatically circumcising males, the circumcision rate rose sharply in the 1960s. By 1960, 83% of all newborn American males were being circumcised. In the late 1950s, the burgeoning American circumcision industry began efforts to spread circumcision to Europe. Of all the European countries, the two Germanys were most often targeted for circumcision propaganda from America. In 1957, the powerful Oakland, California-based corporate giant Kaiser Hospital Foundation sent representatives to East Germany to work with Otto Dietz, um, a minor communist official in the secret police, to promote the mass circumcision of German babies. In 1960, the Goldberg, Goldberg Manufacturing Company, the manufacturer of Gomco Clamp, sent representatives to East Germany as well. In 1968, 2,832 babies had been circumcised in East Germany. As for West Germany, in 1959, 150 German babies born in a state-run clinic in the western German city of Darmstadt were experimentally circumcised without anesthesia as a promotion for the, for the Gomco clamp. The, the Goldberg Manufacturing Company was hoping to open up new markets in the land of the defeated enemies. In 1963, one of Goldberg's representatives in West Germany, Dr. H. Kuster, also um, arranged for the maternity clinic at the University of Gießen to adopt a policy of mass circumcision of all German boys born there. By the light, late 1960s, circumcision met with increasing disfavor among medical officials in both Germanys, and the circumcision experiments came to an end. Opposition to routine circumcision in America did exist. In 1954, Ravitch's theory that the foreskin caused prostate cancer was scientifically invalidated. As early as 1962, the myth that the male foreskin caused cervical cancer in women was scientifically disproven. In 1963, another scientific study disproved Wolbar's theory that penile smegma was a carcinogen. In 1965, the Journal of the American Medical Association published a revolutionary study by Dr. William Keith C. Morgan entitled The Rape of the Phallus. This study invalidated all the then current arguments hospitals used to justify American circumcision. This study generated enormous controversy in the American medical community. The year 1968 saw the publication of yet another groundbreaking study on the nature of the juvenile foreskin. The respected British pediatric journal Archives of Disease of Childhood published the exhaustive study of the Danish pediatrician Jakob Oerster who examined the incidence of prepucial adhesion in 9,545 Danish schoolboys ages 6 to 17. Like Gerdner 19 years earlier, Uster debunked the Famosus myth and maintained that prepucial adhesion was not a birth defect, but a normal stage of penile development. Furthermore, prepucial separation was a normal biological process that required at least a decade to complete in many cases. His research revealed that no intervention into this natural development was ever indicated, and more importantly, that inappropriate attempts to hasten the development could damage the immature foreskin. Uster's study was widely read in Europe and, significant, and significantly advanced the scientific understanding of the penis in Europe. In America, Uster seems to have been ignored as well. In 1970, the Journal of the American Medical Association published another study entitled Wither the Foreskin by Dr. Noel E. Preston, which thoroughly debunked all the circumcision myths. Yet despite all the apparent advances in medical science, in the same year, the third edition of Campbell's Urology, the standard and most respected American urological textbook, declared, 
Phlegmatic stenosis causes extreme difficulty of urination with straining and crying. Hernia or rectal prolapse may be secondary end results. Urinary infection is a, re- is a frequent complication and is often directly predisposed by the prepucial obstruction. Malnutrition, epistaxis, convulsions, night terrors, chorea, and epilepsy have all been reflexly attributed to phimosis. Again, that was 1970. In the same year, in 1960, the Gonco Company, sent represent- Gonco Company representatives had moved into Denmark and arranged for 18 Danish newborns to be circumcised. The results were published in glowing terms in the Danish medical press, but the Danish people could not be convinced to allow their children's penises to be disfigured for any reason. Still, despite such powerful market influences, the American Academy of Pediatrics carefully examined the data on circumcision and in 1971 announced there are no valid medical indications for circumcision in the neonatal period. In the late 1970s, grassroots movements Um, protesting circumcision, the forced circumcision of American children sprang up all over the country. These groups had tremendous influence on the American public, which was becoming increasingly aware of the abuses of power rampant throughout American social institutions. While the basic human right of body ownership and autonomy had been well established since the French Revolution, the the American public grew to realize that the medical establishment had traditionally violated the individual's right to autonomy over his own body. American doctors performed surgery without the patient's knowledge or consent. In the late 1960s and early 70s, the informed consent movement initiated a reform of this abusive situation, and doctors and hospitals were now required to obtain written consent for all surgical procedures. Solicitation of unnecessary surgery was made illegal. Doctors were now required to explain the probable outcome of the surgery, any surgery, the risks involved, and offer alternative treatments. Circumcision, too, now required a consent form, but since the person being operated on was developmentally incompetent to give consent, spokesmen for the circumcision industry claimed that parents could give consent by proxy. Indeed, they now insisted that parents make a decision regarding circumcision for their children. It is clear now that doctors had no legal power to concede control of the baby's genitals to the parents in the first place because doctors had no de jure legal power over the genitals of babies. Meanwhile, there were repeated calls for female circumcision in the medical literature. In 1973, Dr. Leo Wollman, a gynecological surgeon at Maimonides Hospital in Brooklyn, published an article advocating female circumcision as a cure for frigidity. Wollman and the voices that would not be silenced in the male circumcision industry tailored their sales pitch to appeal to the ethos of the sexual revolution of the 1970s. Removal of parts of the male and female genitals would improve and increase the pleasure of orgasm, they now said. This was now the exact opposite of the message given a hundred years earlier. How could the same surgery both decrease and increase sexual pleasure? The very ludicrousness of this new contradictory position, the very fact that American circumcisionists were obviously willing to say anything to push genital mutilation on a gullible but increasingly rebellious public, the mad scramble for new excuses to justify involuntary circumcision only indicates the desperate situation in which the circumcision industry felt itself to have fallen. To make matters worse for the circumcision industry, the AAP, under the enlightened leadership of Dr. Hugh C. Thompson in 1975, issued an even stronger policy statement against circumcision. Because of the new laws of informed consent and the AAP statement on circumcision, Lawsuits were now brought against doctors and hospitals who had circumcised babies without having given informed consents to the parents. The litigious climate forced certain members of the medical community to seek ways of protecting themselves from costly malpractice suits. Spokesmen for the circumcision industry who had infiltrated the AAP now petitioned petitioned the AAP to perform another task force on circumcision that would issue a statement less condemnatory of circumcision and would protect them from legal prosecution for having performed circumcision on unconsenting minors. New excuses for routine circumcision had to be found to justify past actions. New strategies had to be made to combat the threat to corporate profits. The foreskin was now omitted from American anatomy textbooks. 
Myths were circulated to the effect that a boy not circumcised in infancy would be psychologically damaged if he ever saw his father's circumcised penis. Another popular myth stated that an intact boy would feel inferior to his circumcised classmates in a high school locker room or that he would be teased mercilessly by his classmates. The normal human penis had become so unfamiliar to the new generation of Americans that many circumcisionists could claim without fear of rebuke that the scarred, shortened, and disfigured circumcised penis was aesthetically more appealing than nature's design for the penis. In 1985, the circumcision industry stepped up its efforts to squelch the popular rebellion against circumcision. Industry spokesman Thomas E. Wiswell invented the myth that circumcision could reduce the rate of urinary tract infections. Wiswell's representative, I'm sorry, Wiswell's retrospective study found a UTI rate of 1.4% for intact boys and 0.14% for circumcised boys. Circumcision appeared to reduce the rate of UTI by 1.2 percentage points. Most males have never experienced a UTI, and the UTI myth had no power to influence fathers. But sociological research had shown that it was mothers, far more than fathers, who made the circumcision decision for their newborns. Among females, on the other hand, unpleasant and painful bouts of UTI are extremely common. For this reason, the new UTI scare tactic proved to be especially efficient in frightening young mothers into compliancy and agreeing to the circumcision of their sons. Additionally, Wiswell's theory was the first to establish the scientific basis for the argument that no one should be allowed autonomy over his sexual organs. His genius was to demonstrate that the foreskin could threaten the individual's life in the first few weeks of life. This directly undermined the opposition's argument that individuals should be allowed to choose for themselves when they reached adulthood whether they wanted to be circumcised or not. In 1986, Dr. Aaron J. Fink, a urologist from Menlo Park, California, who, like Wolbarst and Ravitch before him, worked tirelessly to promote mass circumcision. He then invented the myth that circumcision could prevent HIV infection. Fink's publication, f- publications revealed that he was among the most disturbed by the prospect of legal action against circumcisers. In 1988, Fink engineered the adopt- adaptation, I'm sorry, <laughs> the adoption of a resolution by the California Medical Association to endorse the concept of newborn circumcision as an effective public health measure. Fink's resolution had been rejected several times by the Scientific Committee of the California Medical Association, but he managed to get it passed by a voice vote after the Scientific Committee had convened for the year. Fink's theory that the foreskin caused AIDS has recently been taken up by great vigor by several North American circumcisionists, such as Francis A. Plummer, J. Neal Simonson, Stephen Moses, Alan Alan R. Ronald, and Joan K. Kreiss. Plummer especially has received a large measure of popular fame because of his ceaseless advocacy of circumcision to prevent AIDS. His efforts appear more to to support the continuation of forced circumcision in America than to prevent AIDS in Africa. In 1989, a new American Academy of Pediatrics task force on circumcision was formed at the instigation of Dr. Edgar J. Schoen of Kaiser Foundation Hospital in Oakland, California, one of the 20th century's most dedicated circumcisionists. In a brilliant coup for the circumcision industry, Schoen was named as chairman of the task force on circumcision. After intense debate, the new task force was able to issue a new statement which satisfied the scientific committee of the AAP as well as the needs of the circumcision industry. The 1989 AAP statement simply concluded, newborn circumcision has potential medical medical benefits and advantages as well as disadvantages and risks. When circumcision is being considered, the benefits and risks should be explained to the parents and informed consent obtained. This statement, as Marilyn pointed out, effectively protected doctors against any further lawsuits while avoiding making any overtly unscientific claims. Confident in the wake of his success, Schoen next tried, perhaps a little naively, to persuade northern European countries to adopt mass circumcision. So far, his efforts in this arena have been unsuccessful. In countries without a history of circumcision domination and without the profit motive in health care, unbiased scientific research was finding the true causes of diseases and exonerating the foreskin. 
Despite the publication of such research, circumcision advocates in America relied upon the general public's ignorance of such research, and Kinney continued to advocate mass circumcision using the disproven myths. Thomas Wiswell, Edgar Schoen, Aaron Fink, Gerald Weiss, Eileen Gelbaum, Francis A. Plummer, and, and others have published numerous opinion pieces advocating mass circumcision for disproven reasons. In the absence of scientific support for their advocacy of circumcision, the motives of circumcision advocates such as Fink, Gelbaum, Schoen, and Weiss cannot be scientific and are more likely to have a deep psychological dimension. This is, not, this is evident by the reaction circumcision advocates have publicly made in response to the foreskin restoration movement. The cosmetic improvements an adult chooses to make for himself should not be of any consequence to pediatricians and midwives. Foreskin restoration represents the circumcised male's first attempt to exert control over his own sexual organs. This exercise in genital self-autonomy appears threatening to the circumcision advocates. Circumcision advocates such as Edgar Schoen and Cappy Rothman have angrily denounced foreskin restoration and have issued false accusations against the gentle, non-surgical procedure in order to dissuade circumcised men from exercising their right of self-determination. Routine circumcision, in the absence of medical indications, exists in an ambiguous legal situation. The problem of informed consent in relation to forced circumcision has recently um, taken on a new dimension. According to a 1995 statement issued by the American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on Bioethics, only a competent patient can give patient consent or informed consent. The concept of informed consent I'm sorry, the concept of informed parental com permission does not apply to circumcision, since the concept of informed parental permission allows only for medical interventions in situations of clear and immediate medical necessity, that is, disease, trauma, or deformity. The natural human penis satisfies none of these conditions. Furthermore, since it is the infant and not the parent who must live the rest of his life with the consequences of this treatment, the individual's right his legal right to refuse treatment, as well as the right, right to seek alternative treatment, has been violated. Likewise, the basic human right to autonomy, self-determination, and the right to an intact body is outlined in Article 5.1 of the American Convention on Human Rights and Article 1.1 of the International Convention on Human, Civil, and Political Rights of 1966 are violated by the performance of non-therapeutic genital amputations. Many new problems have arisen in the last few years. The circumcision industry is a loose, structured confederation of corporations which directly profit from infant circumcision, earning profits in excess of several billion dollars a year. Physicians, hospitals, and insurance companies, contractors, and surgical instrument manufacturers, and medical supply manufacturers all directly profit from this surgery. Direct profits are earned by the sexual aid industry, which manufactures artificial chemical lubricants for circumcised men whose semi-functional penis has been denuded of its gliding mechanism and its natural lubrication glands. Urologists and the industry that supports them by treating the consequences of circumcision, many of which are not seen until later in life, many of which are erroneously attributed to aging, profit from circumcision. Gynecologists profit by treating women for the gyne gynecological trauma inflicted by the semifunctional circumcised penis. Trauma such as vaginal abrasion, dryness, pain, and coital bleeding are common to the female partners of circumcised men. European women do not suffer from these problems to the same degree. For decades, private hospitals have been selling severed foreskins to private bioresearch laboratories and pharmaceutical companies who require human flesh as raw research material. Most recently, several multinational corporations such as Advanced Tissue Sciences, Organogenesis, and Biosurface Technology have emerged to reap billions of dollars of new corporate profits. The legality and morality of this forced organ donorship has not been questioned by the courts or by those making the profits. The baby screams are not yet recognized as political protest. In conclusion, I will just say that the history, the historical record makes it clear that the circumcision of non-Jews in America was first introduced by physicians in the late 19th century as a deliberate method of eradicating childhood sexuality by surgically denuding 
desensitizing and disabling the penis to such an extent as to make masturbation theoretically impossible. It is equally clear that the supplementary and subsequent medical excuses offered to justify the surgical reduction of the genitals of male and female children follow an established pattern. Whatever incurable disease is the focus of national attention in any given time period will be the disease that circumcision advocates will use as an excuse for circumcision. For instance, in the 1870s, when the fear of epilepsy was the focus of national attention, circumcision advocates claimed that circumcision could cure and prevent epilepsy. In the 1950s, when the fear of cancer was the focus of national attention, circumcision advocates claimed that circumcision could cure and prevent cancer. All human cancers, from cancer of the penis, cancer of the tongue, cancer of the prostate, to cancer of the female cervix. Since the late 1980s, when HIV and AIDS have become the focus of national attention, predictably circumcision advocates have claimed that circumcision can prevent HIV infection. Today, because of corporate encroachment, Americans live in a country where they effectively have no rights or autonomy over their own sexual organs. The medical industry, driven by market forces, has created a situation in which anyone, for any reason, can cut off the part of the sexual organs of any child. Since the 19th century, the American medical industry has orchestrated an anti-sexual hysteria and preyed on the American people in a profitable blood ritual frenzy. Only when the American people accept and actively protect the individual's right to genital self-determination and body ownership against corporate greed will the American courts rule circumcision to be illegal. Grassroots efforts to educate the American people have been effective to a degree. But it is now time for European political and medical associations to come to the assistance of the American people and to insist that the North American medical industry cease its promotion, participation, and profiteering in what is by any other standard a senseless and barbaric sexual mutilation of innocent children and a denigration and debasement of the lives and happiness of the adults they will become. Thank you very much.